and I will hand it over to Brenda and Dr. Sally. Okay, hi everyone. Um, as Erin said, uh, my name is Michelle Sally. I am the program director for the public health programs, both on the undergraduate and the graduate level. Um, so our MPH program, which is what this is about today. So what we're gonna cover today is some highlights of the program. Um, but did you want to share the PowerPoint? Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were, we were yeah, just doing I'm on the, yeah, first. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so we have a PowerPoint so you can follow along, but um, I think just listening is fine too. So I'm going to go over some of the highlights of the program. Um, some other activities and opportunities within our program. So I'm on the second slide. Um, there we go. Uh, so careers that you can actually obtain with an MPH degree, our MPH curriculum, our C certification. So we've actually just been accredited by CEPH, which is the Council for Education and Public Health. So um, upon graduation, you're eligible to take sit for the exam to get CPH certified. We'll talk more about that. The requirements for admission, the steps that you need to take to apply, and of course, answer any of your questions or concerns or comments that you have on the program. Okay, some highlights about our particular MPH program is we tend to have small class sizes. So there's a smaller ratio of faculty to students. It allows you to get to know the faculty, um, more opportunities to participate in research with faculty and have more one-on-one -on -one assistance um, as needed in the classroom. So the program provides many opportunities to work within the community while you're a student. This helps build your professional resume and also allow you to start using any skills you've developed or learned so far um, while you're continuing your studies. Our program is grounded in the partnerships that we have in the city of Flint and the surrounding areas. And so Many of our students will work with these uh, partners at agencies and hospitals and whatnot to complete their practical and culminating experiences, and then also often for volunteering as well. And the applied practice and culminating capstone experience, you actually work with an agency, not always the same one for both. But when you finish and graduate, you have real life experiences that you can put on your resume and talk to potential employers. We do not have a cohort, so the program can be completed either part time or full time. Um, I think the majority of our students are part time students, but maybe about a third go full time. And we have a mix of in the classroom and online classes, typically right now during the pandemic. The majority of our classes are online or offered mixed mode, which means they're partially in the classroom and partially online. And typically um, students you know, that go full-time can complete the program in approximately two years. And our part-time yeah. students take somewhere between three to six years to complete the program. So Brenda spoke about a lot of things that go on during the curriculum, but there are a lot of other opportunities and activities that our students are able to you know, take part in. Um, one, which is near and dear to my heart, is COVID case management. Since the um, pandemic broke out about a year and a half ago, um, our students have been very active in acting as case management for our student um, COVID cases or anyone who had been exposed to COVID, or had symptoms of COVID. So that actually, I work with a group of students who actually call all these people to make sure they're getting all the services they need and to make sure that if they do test positive for COVID that it doesn't spread within our community. So um, it's public health in action. Um, I wish the pandemic didn't happen, so we didn't have to do that, but we did take that opportunity to give our students um, a way to get involved with the pandemic. Obviously, they're they're very interested in public health and to um, actually make that part of their um, work here. We also have the public health student organization, which is um, what they call a club, you know, or um, a student org. So this is an organization that was 
developed, um, created maybe, I want to say four or five years ago by the students in public health, although um, any student can join, you don't have to be a public health student. And it was really created to give public health students anything that they felt our curriculum wasn't giving them. And different students wanted different things. Um, we have the plan now that we're eligible, our students are eligible to sit for the CPH exam. We'll be doing study sessions for that. They wanted study sessions for that. Um, we've done resume writing, resume writing workshops. We've done um, dental hygiene drives for dental um, hygiene awareness week. We've done um, condom distribution. So anything that has to do with public health, we've had guest speakers come uh, in. We've had, um, <laughs> believe it or not, this is before the pandemic, we had pizza and pandemic days where we ate pizza and played the game pandemic. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we <laughs> haven't done that in recent days because maybe the timing is bad right now. But um, really, the students are the ones who decide what they want to do. So I encourage you, if you come to our university to get involved with that. We also um, have a chapter of Eta Sigma Gamma, Gamma, which is an honor society for our health education students. This is run, so the graduate student research assistant opportunities run out of actually graduate programs, but I'd say I think every one of us has a graduate student research assistant who helps us with our research and really gets involved in doing some kind of public health research with faculty members. It's a really great opportunity. You work one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member and you get paid for that. It's six hours a week, so it's it doesn't really take as much that much time, so it doesn't get it doesn't interfere with your studies. You know, um, you don't want to work forty hours a week outside the university, then twenty hours on research doesn't leave you much time for studying. So it's a great opportunity to get involved in research. Um, we have students involved in every area of our program's governance. So students sit on all our committees. We have five major committees. Um, one is the advisory committee. We have the admissions committee. Brenda, if I forget one, let me know. We have an evaluation committee. We have a curriculum committee. And um, I think it's called community outreach committee or something like that. And we have uh, at least one student sitting on each committee and they have voting members of these committees. So their vote does count. So when the curriculum committee decides to vote on something, the student actually gets a say in what happens. Um, this, the College of Health Sciences, our department is housed in the College of Health Sciences, have, have probably once a month seminars, seminars and brown bags. So that means that you bring your lunch and you speak usually about somebody's research or some program that they're involved in. And it's a great way to get to know people, to network within the university. It's kind of low risk because you don't have to go to every seminar and every bit brown bag. You can just go to the ones you're interested in. We're also in the process of revamping our heart student clinic. So this is a, a pro bono clinic that we run with um, other departments in our um, college. So it's ran with the PT students, the OT students, and the P PA students will probably get involved. So that gives you a chance to get out to the community and help community members and really see how these things are run. We also are involved with the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, which really was created as a response to all the research going on in the Flint community during the water crisis back in 2014-2015. And um, what the Flint community didn't want to happen was a bunch of researchers to come in, do research in the community, and then just leave and really not contribute to the benefits and, and the bettering of the community. And I'll still talk even though Brenda's um, getting that ready. But so they, cre they created this um, research coordinating center where the community members could give their input into all the research going on in the community. So um, they also have a symposium once a year where you can present your research in the Flint community. And the College of Health Sciences has a Health Professions Education Day every, sem no, I think it's once a year, um, where you can show the work you've been doing. It can be research, it can be, um, any kind of program that you're involved in, whatever that happens to be, you can showcase that. And it also gives you something to put on your resume there. So those are just some of the activities and opportunities you can get involved in while you're here.
MPH careers. So from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, um, we've gathered some of the common careers that MPH holders might take. Um, there's many more. It's a very broad field, you know, that goes across many areas um, of discipline. But common areas that we see students employed are hospitals, medical centers, grant making and giving services, um, local and state and federal government agencies. Um, health educators often work with um, nonprofit agencies, but not always. Some larger companies have health, health educators as well. And I'm not going to read off every single one because obviously you can read it as well. But um, if you have any more questions about the theory, we can talk about it a little bit more at the end of the presentation. But we did check the recent projections for growth in this area, and they're anticipating a 30 percent growth from 2020 to 2030. So very optimistic for the careers in that area. Okay, so let's talk about the curriculum. What are you required to do when you're here? Um, and this is just the coursework that that's required. Um, the curriculum is a minimum of 45 credits. And of those, there are 26 credits that are what we call core courses. So those are courses that you'll need to take no matter which concentration you're in. And they're just the core areas of public health that no matter where you work, you're gonna to have to know something about. So epidemiology, uh, biostatistics, health behavior, um, things like that. And then you'll take 12 credits in whatever concentration you pick. So either health administration or health education. Uh, those are the two concentrations that we have right now. Um, because we realize that everybody has different interests. There are three credits that are elective and we have a pre-selected um, set of courses you can take them from. But if you are interested in something else on the graduate level, we do entertain the thought of you being able to take something in your area of interest as long as it's on the graduate level and it does have something to do with um, what you want to do when you leave. After you finish your, or when you're about finished or after you finish these courses, you'll have an applied practical experience, which a lot of people call the internship, right? Um, where you'll actually be working in a public health setting. Some of those settings are hospitals, insurance companies, um, the places like the Kidney Foundation, and some of them are actually working in the school. Um, I have people working on COVID case management as part of the internship, but you're working on real public health issues with some, some entity. After that, you'll do your, your public health integrative learning experience where you really take everything you've learned and you do a project, and those projects are done with a community-based partner. So they have something they need help with and we help them with it. And you really get that real life experience that you can take to an employer later on or an interview later on and say, I did this. I created this program or I ran this program or whatever that is. And you have some real good life experience once you get out. Um, not only does it convince a potential employer that you know what you're doing, but it also gives a lot of our students more self-confidence to be able to get out there and do that. Um, when you first get admitted to the program, you work with your advisor and the MPH program manager, Brenda, who's really important in doing this, to develop a plan um, for you to graduate within the time frame that you want to graduate. Now, that can change, and we can change plans. They're not written in stone, but it's always good to start out with a plan um, and know where you're headed. And then if something happens in your life, we are fine with people making changes, right? Sometimes you're not working, you think you can take a lot of courses and then you get a job and you can't or vice versa, you know, some things, some life circumstances happen. So we work with our program manager, Brenda, to um, make sure that you're on track for graduation when you need to graduate, when you want to graduate. Yeah, and a little bit more on that. In the internship and the, um, we call it the ILE, the Integrative Learning Experience, you're demonstrating competencies that are um, determined by the council that accredits our program, CEPA. And so you have to identify and then demonstrate competencies in the internship. And so again, that's proving that you're skilled 
and competent in those areas. And then in the ILE, you have to synthesize the competencies. So it's kind of um, showing that you know how to do them and then being able to pull uh, a group of them together and demonstrate them in that fashion. And so in the skipping on the program plan, um, when a student's admitted, I reach out to them to see if they wanna go part-time or full-time. And that can vary sometimes even by the semester. Some students have more time say during the winter than they do during the fall or spring, summer. And so we go based on when courses are offered and tailor that plan to your needs. And also considering the courses that have um, higher level of competencies or higher number of competencies to try to keep them early on in the program so that when it comes time to your internship, you have a good set of skills behind you because you can only choose competencies for courses that you've already passed and learned those skills. So it allows students to kind of do the internship before they're all the way at the end of their program. And Dr. Solly mentioned the CPH exam certification. And um, as we are now accredited by CEPH, our graduates are eligible to sit for the exam. The cost is currently $385, both because of the cost and because we want students to be successful. We don't encourage anyone to just go out and take it to see what it's like. We want students to be prepared and take advantage of the um, study guides and study sessions that Dr. Solly mentioned earlier. You know, we want your money to be well spent and we want you to be successful. So there are online resources available on the link that's on the presentation there. And um, again, as students, you know, request them, we will work with the PHSO and get student um, study sessions scheduled. So I, I think, Brenda, maybe you want to speak about this one because this is more sure. your area than mine. Sure. So as you may have seen already on the grad program's website, um, there are prerequisites to being accepted into the MPH program. You have to have a bachelor's degree from an accredited institution. And we strongly recommend preparation in algebra to be successful in epidemiology and biostatistics. They are entry level you know, epidemiology and biostatistics classes, but they are also at the graduate level. And um, basic at least algebra math is, is beneficial for all students. You have to have a minimum overall undergraduate grade point average of 3.0 on a 4.0 scale. Completion of a course in anatomy and physiology at the University of Michigan Flint. If you haven't completed a course in anatomy and physiology, Bio 104 is our lowest level um, that provides you with sufficient information to be successful. And you don't have to take it at the University of Michigan Flint. It can be taken at any regionally accredited university. And we just need then a official transcript showing that you've completed it with a C or higher before you can be um, admitted. And I think Brenda, this would be yours too. I'm okay. sorry. That's okay. So uh, the steps to become admitted, obviously you apply to, for graduate admission and that's um, what Aaron was referencing earlier. You can get a $55 application fee waived if you apply within the next week. And um, once you submit your application, you should have started processes such as collecting, um, ordering official transcripts from many universities you've attended. They should go straight from that university to the University of Michigan Flint. Um, that makes them official versus uh, you having them and bringing them to us. You need three letters of recommendation to the program with at least one of them should be an academic faculty recommendation. It can be someone who teaches part-time or full-time, but it should be someone who could speak on your ability to be successful at the graduate level. Uh, one of the reasons that's so important is, you know, when we do our bachelor's, say, for instance, my bachelor's degree was 120 credits. Well, that gave me a little room, you know, over all that time that if I had a couple classes I didn't do so well in, um, they didn't, they spread out really far across those 120 credits. When you only have 45 credits, there isn't much room to be unsuccessful in one course and it not impact you significantly. 
Um, also, if you retake a course at the graduate level, every attempt factors into your GPA. Whereas I know at the University of Michigan Flint, at the undergraduate level, you can retake a course. And although it remains on your transcript, the newest attempt is factored into your GPA, which can significantly improve your GPA. And because that does not happen at the graduate level, if a student struggles, especially right from the onset, um, it really decreases their ability to be successful and complete the, complete the program. Um, from student or prospective applicants, we need a statement of purpose. Um, we recommend 500 words less. We will read the whole thing, but um, we really want you to just answer these specific questions and then give us any other information that might help us understand uh, why you would be a good fit for this program. We want to know your understanding of and interest in public health. How you anticipate a master of public health degree will help you in your professional settings. What would you like to do if you earn an MPH? It's very important that you indicate which concentration you wish to pursue. This is part of the application process as well, but some students miss it. You can include it in your essay as well. And you can choose a concentration in health education or health administration. And it looks like I missed part of them. That bullet, and so we also want to know, as same as in your interest in public health and how you want to use your MPH, you know, how specifically are you looking to use that concentration? Why did you choose that concentration? Um, why you're considering attending UM Flint? You know, maybe it's because today you learned some great things about our program. And any special circumstances applicable to your application, perhaps you had um, a difficult semester and you have a valid reason for that, you're welcome to explain that in there or anything else that you think may help us um, find you to be a good fit for the program. And so I just wanna add a little bit into that last circle, special circumstances. Um, we don't just look at what your grades were in undergraduate, right? So if you have any life experience that you feel makes you really a strong applicant, not just for the university or a really strong um, applicant to work in public health, please feel free to add that in there. Yes. Um, and we'll take that into consideration too. Absolutely. So I'll take this one. This is an easy <laughs> one. Um, <laughs> The deadlines for application um, are, we really have rolling applications. So you, you can apply for any semester. And if you miss a deadline, you can, you know, still put in your application and Erin can correct me if I'm wrong, but it will be, you know, it could be considered for the next, if it's too late, it can be considered for the next um, semester. So um, in fall, our deadline is May 1st and, um, Really, you can apply after that, but then you won't be considered for any of these scholarships, um, research assistantships, that GSRA that I spoke about, or grants. So try to get that application in before May May first if you want to um, you want to um, be eligible for any of those. But if you can't get it in by May first, that August first is our final deadline. Winter would be November fifteenth. So our winter session starts in the beginning of January. I know some other universities call that the spring session, but the deadline for that would be November 15th. So if you wanted to get that waiver, you would have to apply by in a week from now anyway. So um, that's kind of an incentive to get your application in on time. And then if you wanted to start in the spring, which starts the beginning of May, um, you would need to have your application in by March 15th. So those are our application dates. You can apply anytime you want, but depending on what date that is, you'd be accepted for whatever the next eligible semester was. Right. And like Dr. Sally said, um, even if you're thinking of a future time, some of our prospective students are still completing their undergraduate degree. And so you could utilize this time to take advantage of that $55 waiver and even apply for fall 22. So you don't have to, you know, wait and miss out on that, or you don't have to wait to apply for spring if you know that's when you're going to be ready. Absolutely. All right, so estimated tuition. I did a screenshot from the website, um, UM Flint website that posts the current tuition. And um, 
it just kind of gives you an idea, you know, for in-state students, it's $679.25 an hour. It doesn't include any fees. Online courses typically have some fees to help support um, the um, software and whatnot that's used to teach online courses. I don't think we have that for this fall, but it's just some exceptions that are being made during the pandemic. As the out of tuition rate, um, Eight credit hours is full time at the graduate level, and so that gives you an idea if you were going full time approximately what the tuition alone would be. And then um, some programs have different and I think it might be at the undergraduate level, um, a different price for credit hours above full time. And so it's just made clear here they're they're actually the same at the graduate level for our program. The link where I got that information is here on the slide, and that's based on our existing tuition rates for fall 2021 and winter 22. Um, they can change every year. They don't always change every year, but um, if you were to apply for fall 22, they could be slightly different. So now we're going to turn this over to you um, with any of your questions. We're here for you to answer any of the questions. Of course, if you don't want to ask them now, or if you don't think of them till later, we are available by email at these email addresses um, here. So, or you could just contact the graduate program um, office and they will, if they can't answer them themselves, they will make sure to get in contact with one of us and we could give you a call or we can answer you by email, um, okay. whichever is more convenient for you. But right now we're gonna turn that over to you and ask you, do you have any questions right now that Brenda, Erin, or I could answer? Yes, I do. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I was taking notes throughout the whole presentation, so I'm just going to roll back to my first portion of questions. This sure. has to do with the activities and opportunities. The Aetna Sigma Gamma, the Honor Society, uh -huh. is there a fee for that or any kind of waivers involved with that? There is are dues, annual dues for that. I would have to look up what they are. I haven't worked closely with that particular organization lately. Um, they tend to be minimal, but I can get that information to you. Okay. And you um, do need to have a certain GPA to be part of that. Okay. And that GPA has to be maintained throughout your um, academic career, is that correct? To, main, to, to maintain status, yeah, in the organization. Okay. Um, the Heart Students Clinic, I'd like to hear just a little bit more about that. Where do they generate the patients from? Is it all from the Flint area or do they expand out? They are in the Flint area. So right now the clinic is taking place at the Sylvester Broom um, building or, or what, I don't know what that's called. They just they just revamped it, but they are all from the Flint area. Um, I don't think there's anybody driving in to take advantage of this. It is a low income um, clinic for the people who live in the area. So um, we wouldn't be getting anyone, I don't think from Davison or <laughs> anywhere like that. So okay. right now it is just in the Flint mm -hmm. area. Okay. A lot of the clients are homeless or like she said, you know, um, low income and so may not have vehicles. So we're trying to service the people um, that tend to be directly right in the area. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, over. Um, the, the capstone project um, and going out to the different community preceptorships. How far out um, do students typically go from from the campus location? How far out do how far out do they go? That's a good question. Um, so we have students who actually can do these experiences on campus, um, such as the COVID case management. And we've had people who have been in Detroit, um, Lansing, I've had people who've gone to Ann Arbor. Um, really, if they found an experience that they wanted to do and it really worked in with um, what the criteria is to pass that experience, they could do that. Um, are you looking to do this from a distance or would you like to do it in Flint? Because there are really opportunities 
both places. Mm -hmm. um, well, just to give you all a, a little background about myself, um, I, I hate using this term non-traditional student as if because of your age, you don't want to learn anything else. Um, I am 60 years old and just finished my undergrad at Western Michigan University um, Congratulations. in 2019. Thank you. And um, my, my initial goal, what it has been for the last three decades, was PA school. But I have a history of a closed head injury. Oh, goodness. And um, I, uh, my injury is quite old, but now I'm being revisited with seizures. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really concerned about whether or not I'm going to be able to physically perform either in the program, during the didactic, and even into my career. So I've always had an interest in public health because I see health as social justice. And Absolutely. so many people, um, people of color, they are denied or they're um, discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And I have a huge interest in that. So, uh, because initially I was gonna get a dual degree of public health and PA, um, but I'm 60 years old and I can't be that broken this old all at the same time. <laughs> so, right, well, um, what's that? Um, I'm, I'm still interested in perhaps pursuing the public health. And if I'm physically able, maybe going on to, to finish the PA program, but I need to have a plan. I need to have other options available to me. Absolutely. So, that's so I, I, uh, go ahead. I think I'm the one who needs to answer that. Um, so I know you hate to use the word non-traditional, but I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, mm -hmm. My route is not entirely different than yours. Um, I started, actually got my high school diploma when I was 44 or 45. I did my GED. Good for you. At, yeah. And then I started out, I thought I wanted to be a chemical engineer. So I started out with a bachelor's degree but I became interested in epidemiology and I went on to go nine years straight from bachelor's degree to PhD. Um, you know, I just kept going. I was like, oh, this is interesting. I'm gonna keep going. And I graduated in 2016 from my doctoral program at the young age of 53 years old. So I defended my dissertation the day before I turned 53. So um, we certainly understand that not everybody takes the same route, right? Not everybody's going to graduate from high school, go, go to college. And you know, right. we understand that life circumstances, not everybody does it the same way. And sometimes I know for myself, I couldn't have done it that way. I just was not mature enough when I finished. I didn't even finish high school. When I dropped out of high school, I wasn't mature enough to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we understand that. As far as um, people who have... Um, some disabilities or, you know, need for additional services or, you know, additional time to do things. And we do have an office on campus that works closely with our faculty to make sure that nobody is shut out from, you know, being able to do their, um, their studies because they need more time or things like that. Um, as far as our capstone and our integrative project that are done with community members, we really run the gamut of a lot of things. So there are, everything is personalized because we are a small program and we, we do work closely with you. I have an internship coordinator that works with every single student to make sure their internship fits in with their plans. So we have opportunities that are online, strictly online that you don't even have to go to the place. And there are other opportunities where you have to be at the place every day. It really depends on what you want to do, what your career is leading you to, what your interests are, and what's available in the, in the um, community. Right now, the only um, real um, requirements of that are that you actually perform the CEF competencies. Um, and we can get you a copy of what the competencies are. None of these are physical competencies, right? You have to be able to perform a statistical analysis. You have to be able to 
um, let's say, implement a behavioral change program, right? And they can be doing, done in many ways. So that's really the only requirement of these, you know, these projects or courses, I don't even know what to call them, um, these, mm -hmm. the capstone and the internship or the applied practical and the, and the ILE, but they're really tailored to your needs. So I think this is actually a great opportunity for somebody who has needs that are a little different than the normal mainstream, what we think of students. I have students who um, last semester or the summer semester who had a newborn baby and just did not want to go out and have anything to do with other people because she was afraid of, you know, bringing this home to the, her child. And we found opportunities for them to do um, their capstone online, um, totally remote, and they were able to fulfill those competencies. So that's the only thing that's required is that those competencies be fulfilled um, and that you work with a community partner. But we have faculty members and like I said, that internship coordinator that really works one-on-one -on -one with everyone to make sure that their capstone or the internship are things that they can do and that actually meet all the requirements for what you'll need to do once you get your MPH. Okay. okay. And so I, I could give you examples. Um, we've had people who worked, um, they work, we have people work on their internship with me on COVID and that is totally remote over the phone or over the computer. I have um, students who have done book clubs remotely with senior centers. So, um, the senior center wanted to know more about nutrition. So we picked out some books that um, were, you know, on a, a level that the seniors could understand. And we did a weekly book club with them. We've had people who have done research and analyses and have written papers on public policy. So they did not need to go somewhere else because, but they were working with an agency who wanted that public policy paper written. I've had people who have done surveys in um, Kochi Villages, with the, which is a senior living community, and the director wanted to know what their needs were health-wise, right? Did they need eye care? You know, what did they need? So we conducted a survey there, and I had a student who did um, analysis of the data and um, made recommendations for things that they could do. So those are just some of the things that we've done. I mean, there, there are a lot more and I could go on and on, but um, really it's an individualized ones. project based on your needs and your really what you want to do when you leave, right? So you can have some experience doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, back in my other life, <laughs> I used to be a certified occupational therapy assistant. And what? after the head injury that ended that career, Mm -hmm. So it pretty much took me on and off probably 20 years just to heal. Oh, I can imagine. So, you know, and I, I, I remember specifically going into the community college. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to get the information, just the information. I'm walking out in the parking lot to my car and I'm like, what just happened? Did I just register for class? <laughs> Am I supposed to be back here Monday? <laughs> So and it just started it from there. Yeah, it started from you. there. And I think 2012. And at the whole time, I had been both of my parents, as much as they tolerated, their caregiver. Until um, 2015, and I came up to Western. So, it, um, and also, too, I have a son that has a mental illness. I have two nieces that are on the spectrum for autism. So I've probably gone to 20 IEP meetings, you know, most of them in California and the ones for my son. So it's just the need for advocacy that I yes. feel has always been what I lean towards. But because I'm a hands-on person, I, I want to know from my patient's mouth, why are you not, why are you not able to follow your health plan? It's not so much about me handing you a piece of paper, but finding out what are you interested in? What What's going to motivate you? Yeah. Yeah. What motivates you? Because if, you know, you say, well, I have to come back to the doctor's office and impress this person because they have on a white coat. 
So to me, white coat syndrome is not just about your blood pressure, but about you giving all the information that is needed for you to have a health plan that you can do. Is that feasible for you? Is that what you want to do? You know, because I had a family member, he didn't want to stop eating candy. So he said, well, that's what the medicine is for. That's why I take the, the insulin. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to stop eating candy. So for me, the route is, well, which one can you eat that's not as bad for you as the candy that you're eating? Because you're not going to stop. So, and it, for me, it's about choices. But it's also, too, it's about advocacy. And I don't like learning it um, from a sheet of paper that somebody else has accumulated all the data. I want to know from, you know, Miss Gracie, what you need today, or Miss Ola, what do you need today? So that's why I, I really like the idea of having the dual degree. And also, too, just because of all of the things that I've been through, you know, up until a few months ago, I was homeless myself. So having to go through all of those loopholes and you need to do this and you need to do that and all the invasive questions that people think that they have a right to ask and they don't but it comes down to i need a roof over my head so i'm going to answer all these ridiculous questions and i'm going to put myself in the position that you believe all these negative things about people that are homeless you know that they're, they're drug addicts and they don't want to work and they don't want to do this and that that's not true. Oh, I absolutely no. agree. Absolutely agree. And yeah, so our a lot of our classes in our program are also very hands-on. I think about health communications, with this, which is something that you're talking about there, right? Um, our professor who teaches health communications, Dr. Lapros, they run a blood drive every, well, I don't know if they did it this year because of the pandemic. They actually got the, the Red Cross canceled it but they run a blood drive. I mean, we, we don't just have classes where you're just learning from a piece of paper, although you have to do some of that, right? You just have mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. But um, we do have a lot of what they call, um, what are they called again? Community community outreach. learning, yeah, outreach, different. Mm -hmm. um, and that's within the classroom sometimes. And I know Jack is actually the the other gentleman on the, on the call. He's actually in at University of Michigan Flint, and he's in the PHSO, so he's done some of these things as well, mm -hmm. although he's an undergraduate, so I think he's interested yeah. in coming to the graduate programs, um, but <laughs> that plots of fun. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, we do try to give our students as much opportunity as possible to, to get some of these experiences, although it looks like you've already had a lot of these experiences. Yeah. And yeah. by you know, the time you're 60, you have some stuff that you've already I, done. I, I hear you. I know. I was, <laughs> I remember sitting in an undergraduate class, sitting down the first day and the kid next to me looking at me and he was a kid. He was 18 for me. He was a kid, looked at me and said, you're Alex's mom, right? Alex was my 17 year old son and he was his friend. So I, I know what it's like to be, you know, kind of out of your age group, but I think we have a good mix of everyone. And we certainly understand that, um, that mm -hmm. everyone's coming with different experiences. And I think everyone's experiences in our department really makes it a richer environment for us, not poorer. If we had just had, you know, people who came straight out of undergraduate, um, after just having finished high school, I think it wouldn't be as rich of an experience for our students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Huh. Okay. Well, I, I definitely um, would like to learn more. I just don't know specifically what that is yet. Sure, <laughs> we're but, here. Um, um, I would like to consider um, this as another option for me, um, the public health route. Um, but I don't know. I just have to wait and see what what God says and what he wants to do with my body so, and where I'm supposed to be. Well, we're here. Um, you have our email address. If not, Erin can get you in touch with either Brenda or I or anyone else in our department for that matter. And I will follow up and send you some materials um, about Ada Sigma Gamma. I'll send the competencies and also our MPH handbook. Okay. 
Um, is is there any opportunity to come on campus and do a tour that way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we do have staff in the office, and one of us can be there as long as it's prearranged. So yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All you'd need to do is email one of us and just tell us like when your availability is and we'll try to match it up and, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, okay. Yeah, because the other, I think, major question that I have is housing. And I, I know for the PA program, when I went to their webinar, they don't have um, graduate housing for their program or their, for their students. There actually is graduate housing on campus in the riverfront, um, which is right across the street from campus. It's apartment style living suites. Um, so you could, you know, I think they, they're in a gray area right now because um, housing is a little bit different, obviously, because of the pandemic, but typically they gear to have a whole floor for graduate students. It doesn't mean it's filled, um, but it is, it is intended specifically for graduate students. Okay, then the other concern that I have is the water. So on campus, our water, I work on COVID with the environmental health and safety. So we speak about that because they actually do the water. On campus, our water is tested regularly and it hasn't been found recently to have anything, you know, that it shouldn't have in it. But we do have coolers around campus that go through filters or have um, water. I can't speak to everywhere in the community if you decided to live off campus, right? Um, there are places still that you can pick up drinking water. Um, I just actually yesterday gave a talk on the water crisis. So I looked into like what was going on recently and in Flint, the, and stop me if I'm talking too much, please, because I tend to get off on, on a tangent when I'm talking about the Flint water crisis, I get very passionate. Um, so about 95% of the lead lines have been changed in Flint. So the lead lines are just the, the pipes that go from the water treatment facility to the houses, right? In the buildings themselves, not all the pipes have been changed. So it really would depend on if you lived off campus, what building you lived in to find out with whatever that landlord is, what they've done to protect their you know, the people, the tenants from the lead. Um, the water is being treated. So I could go through all the scientific stuff because I love it because I'm a little bit of a geek, but the water is being treated. Now that's coming in from Detroit, it is being treated with anti-corrosives. And what that does is start to coat the pipes to protect, um, to kind of make a barrier between the water and the lead pipes. So even if there are lead pipes in the house, hopefully that will start, um, creating the scale that would protect you, but um, not all the houses have been changed their pipes yet inside the houses. So that's where it stands right now. I know there was a lot of money coming into Flint to help facilitate some of those changes, but that's yet to be you know completely done. So I can't really speak to anywhere except for the university. I know we do check um, very regularly, the people in EHS make sure that our water is safe to drink. And we have filters across campus that they provide and make sure that, you know, we keep our up to code and, you know, still working effectively. So, Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, that's a true fear of mine because actually a dear friend of mine was one of the attorneys that worked on the case. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. For all those that have been affected. And I can remember her telling me that during the deposition that one attorney, he admitted that one of the patients that they were um, treating, he said, well, this guy doesn't have any family. We're just going to wait for him to die. Mm, he actually terrible. said that in a meeting. And after going through, because I, my injury was sustained at, at my job. I was riding the elevator and the elevator crashed. Oh. So that's how I got a closed head injury. And I think during the mediation that we went through, they were, they were willing to let me wait to try to kill myself. They accused me of all kinds of stuff. You know, well, you're um, depressed because you're a single parent. You didn't get married. I'm like, are you kidding me? 
but it just the strategies that people use and the dishonesty that's involved in it when money is involved just i think i'm just tainted too so it's it's very it's very difficult for me to trust the systems that are in mm-hmm. place because they knew that the water was contaminated yet they didn't do anything to to mediate that you know and now you have to deal with a whole community of people that are going to display all of those disabilities and disorders because of that. So essentially, some of those things you can't mediate. So some of those children that have been affected, they're going to die with that. So, okay, but that's my end of my soapbox. No, it's it's a very important one. Mm -hmm. But that's the reason why I'm interested in um, both those dynamics to, to physically treat them and then also to be able to ad, advocate for them. And that's okay. actually one of the competencies in the MPH program is advocacy. Uh-huh. That's one of the competencies that you need to, you know, show that you can, you know, demonstrate that you learn and then you demonstrate actually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to really seriously contemplate all of this. Okay, well, thank you all for your time. I'm so happy I was the only one I can get all my questions answered. Absolutely. We would have it answered them anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you all so much, and I'll be um, in contact with you if I have any more questions. Okay. I will welcome. send you a follow-up email, and I'll be sure to include Brenda and Dr. Sally's contact information so you have that. You'll have my contact information, too, so please feel free to reach out to any of us at any time if you have questions or concerns or anything we can help you with, that's what we're here for. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Welcome. All right. Have a wonderful day, Deidre. All right. And take nice care. Seeing you again, Jack. Thank you.